And with that, I'm tremendously excited to introduce Melissa Raffelson, the Associate Dean, George A. Smathers Libraries and Faculty Director, Health Science Center Libraries at the University of Florida. Melissa conducts research in the reproducibility of systematic review search strategies and is currently leading the development of an extension to the PRISMA statement devoted to search strategy reporting. As part of her interest in reproducibility, Ms. Raffelson has led efforts to create a culture of reproducibility at the University of Utah and is now leading similar efforts at the University of Florida. Uh, she's currently chairing the Research Reproducibility 2020 Conference, Educating for Reproducibility, Pathways to Research Integrity. And this is the third Research Reproducibility Conference she has developed. She received the Estelle Broadman Academic Medical Librarian of the Year Award in 2015. And with that, I will turn um, the screen over to Melissa. Okay, thanks everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here. And I would just like to give special thanks to the program committee, not only for coming up with the idea of having this kind of conference, but for um, also putting together such a terrific program that I personally can't wait to see. So um, I'm very excited to get done with my keynote so that I can learn more about what everyone else is doing. Um, and for my keynote, I'm planning to just go over some very basic things about uh, reproducibility and, and how librarians should and, and could be involved. Um, but then you'll get to hear so, so much later uh, in today. Um, so first of all, uh, <laughs> What is reproducibility? Well, this is something that has um, been a kind of a cornerstone of science for so many years, um, thinking about how science can actually be redone, can be built upon, can be uh, reproduced. And I know that the organizers have provided you with a lot of definitions looking at reproducibility and replicability, so I would encourage you to consult those as well. But reproducibility is something that has kind of generated a lot of excitement uh, recently, even though it's been around as a concept forever. Uh, since in 2005, John Ioannidis published this classic article, Why Most Published research findings are false. This article, if you've ever read it, is kind of esoteric. It looks at statistical models to show why research might not be quite as true as we think it is. But what's really happened is that um, over time, a lot of people have actually decided to find out whether or not most research is true. One of the most impactful of those was this study that was published in Nature in 2012 by Begley and Ellis, who were at Amgen. When at Amgen, they decided that they would try to reproduce uh, 53 different uh, studies of cancer uh, biology that was looking at the, the drug development around uh, for cancer. And they found that they were able to reproduce only about 11% of the research that had been done on these topics. That was followed pretty quickly by a major study from um, the Center for Open Science and Partners on looking at psychological science. And again, this group found that only about 34% of studies could be reproduced. As these kinds of studies started coming out, this really started to be something that not only got replicated um, in other areas um, from disciplines as diverse as economics and political science, even in the humanities, um, business and management, and all sorts of different sciences, but it really became something that uh, the popular press latched onto. And we started seeing a lot of articles about the reproducibility crisis or the replication crisis showing up in things like the New Yorker, the Atlantic, uh, Slate and other kinds of periodicals that a lot of people had access to. And the um, overall uh, gist of these is that maybe science isn't quite as self-correcting as that we think that it is. So 
reproducibility, replicability, generalizability, all these are terms that get thrown around uh, for this particular topic. But really what I'm doing throughout this presentation and what we're doing throughout today, I think, is using reproducibility as, as a generic term for all sorts of different things. So whether or not something is computationally reproducible, whether or not a study can be redone in a different setting, whether or not results can be generalized to uh, other places, um, or whether or not we're looking at the reproducibility of results or the reproducibility of methods by looking at the how well they're actually represented in text, or even looking at how well um, the statistics were done and whether or not we can draw similar conclusions uh, as the original studies have been done. So reproducibility has been shown to be a bit of an issue, uh, but what causes it? There's a lot of different factors that go into causing irreproducibility, and just going to briefly go through some of them. One of them that has shown up uh, quite a bit is just the actual hardware of science itself. Um, perhaps one of the most notorious um, versions of this is around uh, cell lines and cell cultures. So this article here obviously is a little bit inflammatory, six decades of uh, studies, false, um, but it's not entirely incorrect because um, there are cell lines that have not been authenticated. Probably many of you have heard of Henrietta Lacks um, and through the Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, the book, or, or just through your own experience in science, but her cells or HeLa cells um, are in fact immortal and they're incredibly aggressive about taking over other cell lines. And so the first um, large scale report on contamination of HeLa into other cell lines happened in the 1980s. Um, but yet, in this slide shows that uh, papers still are continuing to get published using cell lines that are known to be contaminated with HeLa. In uh, two, the mid 2000s, a test was introduced to be able to authenticate pretty easily authenticate cell lines called short tandem repeats. And even the introduction of that study did not really slow down the use of contaminated cell lines. So cell lines are just one of the materials and equipment that might become an issue causing irreproducibility. There are other things like antibodies and reagents and even equipment that hasn't been appropriately calibrated all can be causes of irreproducibility. Probably the, then the next big one is actually in study design. And this has a lot to do with how people are trained or not trained to conduct research. Uh, so for example, um, a lot of studies are published that don't have any controls. They might not have their samples randomized. They might actually have a sample size that's just far too small to actually measure what they're trying to look at. And they hadn't even thought about trying to figure out what an appropriate sample size might be using a power calculation. There's other things too that have been pretty pervasive in the literature, like not looking at uh, different genders or different sexes um, in different kinds of research studies. And this is particularly true in animal research where male animals were often used as the default for tens of years um, due to the fact that there was some concern that, that female mice estrus cycle, for example, uh, would cause differences that would cause research to be irre irreproducible. And instead, what really happened is that, um, that it became irreproducible because females weren't actually put into the equation. So drugs, for example, that might have been de developed using a mouse model might not actually have uh, performed as well um, in different genders, but no one knew that. Another major factor in, irreproducible, in irreproducibility uh, it evolves uh, data, documentation, and analysis. So this is one that I think is, is most commonly associated with irreproducibility and the reproducibility crisis in general, um, particularly around the, the concepts of statistical analysis and computational reproducibility. So my pumpkin there is P equals 0 0.06, um, the scariest thing that a scientist can see showing that their study has not achieved statistical significance. Um, and this problem 
um, of not achieving statistical significance has been known to cause people to do a, a few things. So one is p-hacking, which is adjusting the data that you have um, and, and adjusting your analysis so that you can get that elusive p equals 0 0.05. Another is harking or hypothesizing after results are known. Uh, which is kind of a no-no because your study is supposed to be designed to achieve a certain hypothesis. Another one that's really common, uh, especially in medicine, is outcome switching, where you might have taken a study um, and you're looking for one particular outcome, but that outcome doesn't achieve statistical significance. But then you play around with your data a little bit and then you see, oh, there was this other outcome that actually shows that it had some sort of causal effect. And people will then switch the entire point of their, uh, their research so that they can have some sort of outcome that achieves statistical significance. Computational reproducibility, of course, involves a lot with the, the data itself and how it's organized, how it's maintained and kept, what kind of analysis has been done, and how those scripts uh, to do those analyses have been documented and saved and preserved, as well as the, the actual environment that's used to do the calculations. But again, the, this is probably the most common uh, cause of your reproducibility that you see uh, show up, and it's caused some really big scandals, um, one of which is the story of Brian Lansing. Brian Lansing was a nutritionist at Cornell University, and his work was known all over the United States. Um, and it was really put into a lot of school nutrition policies on a national level. Um, but unfortunately for Dr. Wensing, people started investigating some of the work that he was doing. He wasn't able to produce data. So then people started doing FOIA requests and found a lot of, of <laughs> evidence <laughs> that uh, he was busily p-hacking uh, with his co-researchers. So in this particular email, he wrote that it seems to me that the p-value should be lower. Do you want to take a look at it and see what you think? If you can get the data and it needs some tweaking, it would be good to get that one value below 0 0.05. Uh, Wansing's case just makes it sort of evident uh, how pervasive this is, but there's been other research uh, that shows that this is not an uncommon occurrence. So for example, this study of looking at biostatistical consultants found that uh, biostatisticians are frequently asked by principal investigators and other researchers to make concessions in their statistical analysis that would enable them to get statistically significant results. Many scientists also say that they know colleagues who have committed questionable research practices, such as p-hacking and harking, but don't necessarily admit to doing it themselves. But the fact that they know of colleagues or, uh, that have done these practices or know that their colleagues are doing these practices shows that this is probably much more pervasive than most people are, are even willing to admit. P-values have become such a central component of research that we're really seeing lots of uh, P-values just proliferate across the literature. Uh, this study that was done uh, and published in, um, just a few years ago by John Ioannidis and team showed just the prevalence of P-values that are 0 0.05 um, or lower in uh, published abstracts. And although it looks as though the proportion of those is declining, um, the fact is, is that in medical journals, biomedical journals, still 95% of abstracts that have a p-value have a significant p-value in those abstracts. And this is showing a lot of publication bias, but it's also showing that people don't feel that they can get published uh, unless they actually have that significant p-value. A lot of people are out there specifically looking to identify this sort of issue as well. Um, and so this article uh, shows the data thugs, so-called. Um, 
James Heathers and Nick Brown that have been doing a lot of work trying to identify some of these, but they're not alone. Uh, there, this has been a pretty widespread thing now that we have social media and post-publication peer review, where people are pointing out a lot of these errors or questionable research practices that probably would have gone unnoticed or uncommented upon previously, and they're putting it out there publicly now. One of my favorite studies recently was a study uh, that Victoria Stodden and team published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in which they looked at papers that had been published in science after science had an open data policy where data sharing was expected um, and found that not only did people not have the data um, appropriately available, but um, only 26% uh, of the things that they that they studied could actually be reproduced computationally. Uh, this is an article that's really worth reading in its entirety, uh, but there, my favorite part is actually some of the quotes that I think show the enormity of the problem. So they actually contacted all of these researchers who uh, may not have provided links within the text to data and tried to get the data directly from them. And many of these PIs would um, not only be somewhat menacing or threatening, um, but sometimes they would just say, yeah, sorry, this is, the code's not really any good or not user friendly, so uh, we can't really share it with you. And it wasn't really uh, put together for other people to use, so sorry, we just don't have the time to do documentation. Another major cause of irreproducibility is non-transparent reporting. And this is something that has been shown over and over in dozens of fields that people really just aren't able to provide or don't provide the amount of details necessary to actually be able to reproduce a, an experiment or a study appropriately. Part of this has to do with just um, the fact that journals in the past have had very tight size limitations. Um, part of it has to do with not enough training or knowledge about what actually you need to report. Uh, this study was done looking at animal research and they actually found that um, in this, this study on papers that were reporting about animal research, uh, the only thing that 100% of the papers um, uh, did was actually talk about their title and they had a title and then they mentioned an experimental outcome. Um, after that, all of these different kinds of components that are part of the ARRIVE checklist, which is an animal research uh, reporting guideline, uh, weren't mentioned. And I think the worst is the fact that fewer than 20% of the, the papers that they studied in animal research didn't even report the sample size. Um, that's a pretty shocking amount, um, and it, but it shows the, just the, the true problems that are out there. So I talked about some of the things that can make individual studies irreproducible, but really I think we need to think about reproducibility as a systemic problem that has a lot of root causes. And the root cause, uh, in my opinion, is largely the, the sheer volume of perverse incentives that we have in academia and in research in general. So we value the impact factor over the actual impact of an article. Um, we value publishing um, at quantity of articles rather than looking at the quality of the research published quite often. Um, we require our researchers to achieve funding and in order to get funding they have to have high impact publications and they have to be published in many articles otherwise they might not get the grant. Um, and we certainly just in general value um, the, the sheer volume of research output uh, that someone can produce. So I've worked at an institution, for example, where uh, to be an associate professor, you had to publish at least 25 articles. And to be a full professor, you had to publish 50. And those were actually built into the tenure and promotion standards. So it's things like this that can be really perverse incentives for people because there's no time to slow down and think about them. So what are some of the consequences? I think the biggest consequence really uh, is looking at the distrust that is uh, showing up in science, whether or not that this is uh, looking at vaccines, for example, um, or whether or not it's just looking at generally um, the belief that science may not be as good as we think it is. Um, and 
public trust in science is still really high, but as more and more of this stuff comes out and we see more scientists publicly uh, taken down for their shoddy science, um, it's going to become more and more of a problem. I think the other major problem, which directly ties to that, is the fact that this is a very costly enterprise. So this is just a, a graph looking specifically at preclinical research, um, which shows that about $28 billion worth of money per year in the United States is being wasted on irreproducible clinical research. Um, but that's just one field and one discipline. And uh, when politicians uh, find out that uh, this kind of research waste is going on, the chances that we're going to see the same kinds of levels of funding uh, is probably not as great, and at least it's something to be a little bit concerned about. So what can academic libraries do? Well, I think we can do tons of stuff. We're really experts in literature, publishing, authoring, we're experts in critical appraisal, teaching evidence-based practice. Uh, we really have a broad understanding of science and the research life cycle, and we do it from a transdisciplinary perspective, where it's not just all about one field or one discipline, but we can see across the humanities, the social sciences, the hard sciences, and the health sciences. Libraries are also really big connectors on campus, so we know people and we can connect people with people. And that's partially because we don't really have a stake in the game. We're really also great partners in research. Many of us already have partnerships with various research groups on campus. It might be either the Office for Research, it might be many other different things. Uh, but each of us has already built a lot of these connections that can help things be really effective. So just a few examples of things that I think that people can do uh, in libraries to help support reproducibility. Um, it, what the first is just to build awareness of this topic. And how could we do that? We can do things like build guides and tools. So for example, building libguides about reproducibility. We can look at specific aspects of reproducibility and help support um, those particular areas and make people aware of them. So for example, at the University of Utah, uh, before I arrived there, there, there was a big push to do a lot of stuff around sex and gender differences in health research. So we've built a research guide. They had some videos that showed um, gender differences in thinking about healthcare topics amongst different populations. They had a, um, a conference that they sponsored and, and got a grant to do so, all around sex and gender research. We can also do things like put on seminars and series, whether it's hosting a journal club, like a reproducibility, a reproducibility, uh, which I always say reproducibility tea, but you know, one of those. And uh, we can also do things like have seminar series, host speakers, um, get the word out that these are issues that are really something people should be talking about. And then, of course, we can host longer things like conferences and workshops. So Cure and Tier are host, co-hosting um, in April a workshop on curating for reproducibility. So how can we, as uh, librarians interested in data, for example, curate that data properly to make sure that it can be reproduced? Um, the Research Reproducibility Conference that I'm hosting um, here at UF on March 17th is another example. Uh, data symposiums that people are hosting out of libraries, these are all great opportunities for us to be leaders and to bring the conversations to our universities. We can also do a lot around education and pr the provision of tools. So we can do things like provide great literature searches, we can help with critical appraisal, we can do a systematic review and other forms of evidence synthesis. We can teach about the top guidelines or transparency and openness guidelines for publication. So how do you cite data? How can you be transparent about your methods? How can you actually share your code? Um, where can you pre-register a report? And we can teach a lot of workshops and other kinds of topics within courses and uh, individually. So are you hosting data carpentry classes through your library? Can you actually go out and teach about building research pipelines and workflows? Uh, what about doc data documentation? There's all sorts of different ways um, that we can use our skills to go out and teach. 
And we can provide a lot of tools. So whether or not it's things that we just link to or teach about, such as the Open Science Framework, which is openly available, or things that we might subscribe to, like electronic lab notebooks, we can actually teach about and learn how to use these tools so that our clients can learn how to use them as well. And I think most importantly, perhaps, we can be advocates for this topic. And we can be advocates in a lot of different ways. We can make a lot of connections for people. Obviously, we're not going to be out there authenticating cell lines, but we might figure out who the people who can do that are so that when someone has a question about how to put that into their grant, they could actually come to us and we could provide a connection to them. We also could know about the statisticians that might be available for our researchers and who on campus might be a great study design expert that we can refer someone to. We can also do things like creating coalitions to solve issues. So for example, at the University of Utah, we created a coalition that had people from all over campus coming together, uh, meeting regularly to talk about how we could really advance reproducibility across our institution. And having this group was a great way to talk about things in a transdisciplinary manner and having it associated with the library was really great. We can also do our own post-publication peer review. We can advocate for post-publication peer review, of course, for open science and open access. We can lobby journals to have policies that embrace transparency and openness. And we can also advocate publicly for things like badges on uh, journal articles and conference proceedings or other types of incentives that really can help drive change. So overall, I think that libraries are great places uh, to have this reproducibility conversation uh, because we can approach it from so many different fields and we have so much knowledge, as Frank said earlier. And uh, I, again, I'm just really happy to be here and I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to take a couple of questions. Thank you, Melissa. That was terrific. Um, so we have a few minutes for some questions before we go into our first break. Um, so if you have any questions, um, please share them in the chat. Is we have a, a question, um, Melissa, can you share any real life success stories? Um, like a real life success story in terms of how li libraries can help? I think I can. Um, so the University of Utah perhaps was um, a great real life success story in so far as we got people on campus really interested in this topic from a um, institutional standpoint. So I think probably my biggest success um, personally was actually working with our vice president for research on this issue. Um, and we actually got together groups of people to look at maybe writing grants to help support reproducibility. We had the two conferences that we had um, over 150 people attend each time uh, to talk about reproducibility and how individuals and institutions can help make changes around them. Um, there's a lot of success stories individually with researchers who have adopted reproducible uh, reproducible types of research and who are really looking at this issue. Um, but right now we're kind of in a, a bit of a culture clash where we have um, a lot of people who've had a lot of success doing things maybe not in the greatest way like Brian Wensink did and those people are starting to maybe get caught in some ways but this is still um, a major major challenge on our campus uh, on all of our campuses and across the world um, and so the individual success that people are having is great. And I think having some of these um, things like in psychology in particular that has just gone through a complete sea change and looking at reproducible, 
reproducibility and the practices around reproducibility is a great model. So for example, in psychology, um, they of course now are using, a lot of them are using the open science framework. They're pre-registering their study designs so that they can't go back and do things like switch the analysis or switch the outcomes without a lot of explanation around that. Um, they are doing things like having badges um, on their articles to highlight open data practices and the reproducibility of uh, the computations. Uh, that are associated with them. Um, we're seeing a lot of um, different looks at rigor uh, within psychology in particular, but other disciplines as well uh, that are, are really starting to come out because of how obvious some of these problems have started to become. So I think there's dozens and dozens of great examples out there. Um, psychology would be one that I would consider, um, but we're still in this area where doing um, sloppy research is sometimes very much rewarded, so it's hard for individuals and early career researchers quite often to individually um, have those success stories as of yet. Uh, great, thank you, Melissa. Um, so we're in the break time. Uh, Melissa had said that she would answer a couple questions during the break. Um, so there's a few questions. We'll hopefully get through a couple of them. Uh, if you need to get up and get a drink, um, <clears throat> we will reconvene for the first session um, in seven or eight minutes. Um, in the meantime, Alyssa, there's a couple other questions for you. We should start with, um, you said during your talk that libraries do not have a stake in the game. Can you say more? Um, it seems like that's why we're all here today. Oh, yes. Yeah. So what I was just saying or trying to say is that our stake in the game is um, has less to do with uh, the individual politics on our campuses uh, because we are more of a neutral ground. So that's what more I meant is that our position tends to be um, more neutral um, and not discipline specific. So we're not competing with the College of Medicine for funding. We're not competing um, with our uh, College of Engineering. And so we don't have that sort of siloed vision. And that's really what I meant by that. Now, do I think that we have a major a role to play in this obviously I do or I won't be here and I want to have been working on this problem for over five years now uh, great thank you well we're also going to collect the questions that we don't get to and we're gonna put them into the shared note-taking document which people are wonderfully using um, and so Melissa will have an opportunity to answer some of those there um, so maybe one more question um, from Kevin Reed, thank you for the talk, Melissa. As a director of a health science library, how do you envision gaining institutional resources and being able to build sustainable services for supporting all of these initiatives? I think that's a great question. And I think it really depends on your particular institution as to what kinds of things are going to be the most useful. Um, what kinds of things are the most needed? Uh, there are some institutions that already have a lot of resources uh, built into them. And it might just be a matter of sustainably figuring out how to align uh, services with theirs or to be able to just serve as a connector or resource point. It might be that, um, like me, you're really interested in building up systematic review services and so um, you might end up working with a department on campus or a group on campus that would be interested in funding positions around that. Um, working on uh, figuring out how to actually get involved in uh, individual grants, I think, is another big one. Um, charging for some services, if there's really high level kinds of things that libraries are supporting, like statistical analysis or actually providing full data management kinds of services or systematic reviews is another one. Um, my vision essentially, I think it has to be customized to the type of, of institution that you're at. I've been at R1 institutions for most of my career, and so most of my ambition uh, has to do with, uh, it's pretty large scale, but that doesn't mean that that's what every library has to do. I think it has to be customized to what the needs of that institution are and um, what the resources that that library has available or can tap or can develop. Uh, great, thank you. Um, we'll maybe do one more. Um, so from Lauren Collister, uh, I think you mentioned 
uh, that you have a grant to develop some reproducibility materials. Can you talk more about that grant or other ways to support this kind of development in libraries? Sure. So um, I received two grants from the Office of Research Integrity to host the conference that I have coming up in March, um, as well as the one that I had in 2018. So that was one uh, big grant. Um, also, I've gotten funding from um, the Clinical and Translational Science Award groups at the University of Florida and at the uh, University of Utah to support systematic review services on both of those campuses. Um, so those are, of course, affiliated with grant funding as well. Um, I have also been on NIH training grants. Um, the NIH in particular has, has been really on top of this issue, as, as any of you who work in health sciences might know, and have required rigor and reproducibility um, types of components in not only their training grants, um, but in all of the grants that are submitted through the NIH, but training grants in particular, they need to actually refer to rigor and reproducibility training. And so I've been added to some of those grants as key personnel uh, in order to provide rigor and reproducibility training. Um, there also have been initiatives through the National Network of Libraries of Medicine and other places for libraries to apply to get grants to put on conferences. Um, there have been um, ones to provide outreach. Uh, the National Library of Medicine is, of course, another source of grant funds. Um, my perspective is pretty health sciences focused, so I'm sorry I don't really have any great suggestions in terms of National Science Foundation, for example, or, or other um, social sciences or humanities disciplines, um, but there is a lot out there. Um, National Science Foundation in particular is also really interested in this topic, and sometimes it's just a matter of actually looking at their grant opportunities, um, whether or not it's through your local office of research that's providing information about those or whether or not you sign up for alerts from some of these groups as well. Um, but those are some of the ones that I've worked on. Thank you so much, everyone.